Good evening, everybody. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, again uh, Francis Makwabe. Um, I'm the consultant nephrologist and physician and chief medical director of AHN Tanzania. So um, uh, uh, the one who will be moderating this session is Dr. Alejandra Vima. Uh, is an associate professor of pediatrics, University of KwaZulu-Natal and a uh, specialist pediatric nephrologist. Uh, nephrologist uh, in Kosi Albert Rizuri Central Hospital, Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Uh, he's a deputy chair of Biomedical Research Ethics Committee of the University of KwaZulu-Natal and the member of the ISN AST Capacity Building Working Group. He's also a chief of the uh, transplant panel of the KwaZulu Natal. So, uh, Dr. Bima uh, has a very uh, wide experience in pediatric nephrology and is practicing in South Africa. So, he'll be moderating this session and uh, he, he'll be the one who will be uh, inviting uh, our today's uh, discussant, who is Professor Alpana Iyenga. So, he will go through the, uh, the bio of Alpana and then he will invite Alpan. Dr. Vima, please, ah. Halim. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mokaba, for that. I um, think that's quite a long introduction. I wanted to cut it short to just say that I'm a pediatric nephrologist because every time we see pediatric nephrologists, the ones who treat adults tend to run away. They leave the meeting and go. <laughs> but anyway, we are really privileged today to have with us um, someone who is really distinguished, and that's Dr. Alpana Iyenga. She's actually been with us last week, so I think many of you all would have, um, would have met her on the, online and you would have interacted with the FEP asking questions. But just to fulfill you, uh, for those of you who were not on the, on the Zoom call, that she is the professor and, uh, at, in the Department of Pediatric Nephrology at St. John's National Academy of Health Sciences, and that's in Bangalore, India. Now, she has got many portfolios, and I'm not going to go through every one of them, but just to go through a few, she is deputy chair of the International Society of Nephrology Clinical Research Program, which I belong to to some way, and a core community member of the ISN Education Committee, and executive member of the ISN in South Asian Regional Board, as well as uh, she holds the hat of having the fellow, being a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and has uh, been involved as a specialist uh, nephrologist uh, in um, many other areas in uh, the National Health Authority of India. So she is very distinguished in the field and we are really, really privileged and honored to have her today to speak to us about renal records. And this is something that we often see, although some of it gets referred initially to our endocrine specialists who then call us and say, look, I think this patient has records, but it's mainly from a renal origin. So Dr. Alpana, without further ado, I want to hand over to you because this is your, your Thank talk. you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Vima. That was a very generous introduction. Uh, <laughs> good evening to Dr. Lloyd, uh, Dr. Makwabe, Dr. Francis, and uh, all of you delegates, it's nice to be back after a week. And this time we are jumping from the glomerular compartment to the tubular compartment and are going to discuss about a common problem uh, in children uh, that we pediatricians basically would see. Actually, we would be the first contact uh, doctors who would uh, encounter such a child. And it is very important to detect or diagnose or recognize renal uh, rickets. So I will share my slides. Great. Like last Go ahead. Time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. So uh, let's begin. So I was saying that um, we chose this topic rickets because I thought that um, uh, we in India and you in Africa uh, definitely would encounter this common problem. And as we see it, Many a times these kids get missed, the diagnosis get 
gets missed because um, either they are uh, treated like a nutrition rickets, which is definitely, yes, much more common than renal rickets, or they end up with an endocrinologist and then uh, the evaluation actually begins um, in, in the lines of non-nutrition rickets. That's, that's one uh, reason why I brought this up. The second reason is that this, this topic took me back to my uh, trip to Ethiopia about four years back when we visited Addis Ababa Hospital. And uh, when I was sitting in the renal clinic there and uh, seeing patients with my uh, colleague uh, from Addis Ababa, uh, I was told that there was a period in time where soda bicarbonate was not available and children who had renal uh, tubular acidosis uh, and who would come in with an emergent issue could not uh, you know, be administered sodium bicarbonate. So that was an eye opener. That was something that we never expected we take it for granted it's so easily available in india it's cheap but and it's life saving in in these kids so um it it just brought me that memory and then i thought okay let us let us talk about renal rickets so basically we all know as pediatricians and pediatric nephrologists that rickets is um a, a defect of the growing bone when we talk about nutritional rickets it is a defective mineralization of the bone that leads to softening of the bones. And basically you have two types of rickets, that is calcipenic and phosphopenic. And if I can say the phenotypic presentation of calcipenic rickets is muscle weakness, bony pain, predominant upper torso involvement, tetany episodes, calcium is usually low, phosphorus is low, they could be elevated alkaline phosphatase and elevated paratormone. In contrast, what happens in phosphopenic rickets is that lower limb uh, anomalies or deformities are more predominant, children are short, there is some abnormality and deformity in the dentition, and then you can have normal calcium with low phosphorus and near normal uh, alkaline phosphatase and paratormone. So these are the differences in the characteristics of a calcipenic, which may be nutritional, which may be CKD, wherein you have vitamin D deficiency and calcium deficiency in contrast to phosphopenic rickets, which is basically due to low phosphate. So when we talk about renal rickets, we have to start from this point of diagnosing a vitamin D resistant rickets. So when do we diagnose that? We diagnose vitamin D resistance when there's no response to vitamin D and calcium and supplementation for three months. I know that we have different regimes. Our country has a different regime. Uh, there is a different regime uh, in the West. So I'm sure Africa also has got their own regime of treating a suspected nutritional rickets. When there is no response with the supplementation of vitamin D and calcium for three months, there's no evidence of healing, then we diagnose vitamin D resistant rickets. So once we come to this point, in a very simplistic way, I will go to a little more complicated way to, towards the end, but let me begin with a very simple way of categorizing the various causes for renal rickets. So we start with renal failure, for example. Is there renal failure? Is the creatinine normal or abnormal? If it is abnormal, then it is chronic kidney disease, mineral bone disease, or also earlier called renal osteodystrophy. If there is no renal failure, and then the child has not responded to your vitamin D therapies for, for three months, then you look for metabolic acidosis. If the metabolic acidosis is present and there is no renal failure, there is metabolic acidosis, you think of renal tubular acidosis. And if there is no renal failure, but there is no metabolic acidosis as well, then we think of familial hypophosphatemic rickets or another entity called vitamin D dependent rickets. So there are four different types of renal diseases that can lead to rickets. Chronic kidney disease, renal tubular acidosis, familial hypophosphatemic rickets, and vitamin D dependent rickets. So why are we talking about kidneys when we're talking about rickets? Rickets is definitely obviously seen in the bone. The, there are bone deformities. Now, where does the kidney come into play? 
So we all know that vitamin D is absorbed from the skin or through the diet in a small way. And all this gets into the liver as 25-hydroxy cholecalciferol further gets converted to 125. That is the active form of vitamin D in the kidney. And this active vitamin D further acts on various tissues, bone, intestine, and other tissues in reabsorbing calcium. Now you have a 25 hydroxylase enzyme that is helping the hydroxylation of vitamin D in the liver, which is encoded by the CYP2R1. And there is one alpha hydroxylase that helps in the, to the, and it helps in the conversion of 25 hydroxy to 125 active vitamin D, again encoded by CYP27B1. These um, are important because the defects in these um, genes would cause, uh, again, disease. So I'll come to that in a bit. There is also the vitamin D receptor that is important. Just having 125 vitamin D doesn't suffice. This 125 vitamin D can function only when it gets attached to these vitamin D receptors. So in chronic kidney disease, we know that the GFR comes down and the uh, production of 125 hydroxy um, cholecalciferol uh, is, is reduced. And it's not only the reduction in this level, probably there is also a role of vitamin D receptors that are not functionally uh, active. And therefore the 125 cholecalciferol cannot um, function normally. So we have, there, there'll be a decrease 125 vitamin D in CKD. In addition to this, you have increased FGF23, which is actually the earliest abnormality seen in CKD MBD, then phosphate retention, calcium deficiency, all leading to increased parathormone levels over time. And there is metabolic acidosis in addition to all this. So this these are the various mechanisms that actually cause uh, the mineral bone disease in CKD. What happens in renal tubular acidosis? So here there is metabolic acidosis and to buffer the acid, there is leaching of a lot of minerals from the bone like hydroxyapatite and therefore there is calcium um, uh, deficiency too in, in proximal tubular acidosis, there can be phosphate leak. So again, there, there are these are the reasons for a child with renal tubular acidosis to present with uh, defective mineralization or rickets. Vitamin D dependent rickets is a very different entity wherein you may have, there are two types, you have a problem because this enzyme 1-alpha hydroxylase is not functional, it is defective and therefore the conversion of 25 to 125 is not uh, normal and uh, you, you, you will have a decreased 125 because of this defective 1-alpha hydroxylase. So there, there are two, this is vitamin D dependent rickets type 1. And when 1-alpha hydroxylase is involved, it is type 1A. And if the enzyme 25-hydroxylase, again, there is a defect there, then it is vitamin D dependent rickets type 1B. So there are again two types in vitamin D dependent rickets. Now, Type 1 is because of these two enzymes. Type 2 is not really because of the 1-alpha hydroxylase problem or the 25-hydroxylase problem. It is because of this vitamin D receptor. So there is, a, uh, there is a defective vitamin D receptor or there is something called vitamin D response elements. Now this 125 has to get attached to these receptors or should get be functionally active when they combine with these uh, response elements and so on. So when there is a problem here, you get vitamin D dependent rickets type two, which is worse in terms of the clinical outcome. What happens in hypophosphatemic rickets? So these are some of the newer advanced uh, um, uh, observations that have come over in the last few years. FGF23 is secreted in the osteocytes in the bone. And it's controlled by this FEX gene. So when there is a problem with the FEX gene, there is increased FGF23. So what is FGF23? It is a phosphaturic hormone, which means it facilitates phosphate leak in urine. So FGF23 would 
cause phosphate leak in urine by making these phosphate transporters, which you see here, they become inactive. So the reabsorption of phosphate is defective and there is phosphate leak. This FGF 23 also inhibits the 125 uh, vitamin D and it suppresses the PTH. It uh, decreases the phosphate absorption in the intestine and all this leading to increased hypophosphatemia, increased phosphate loss. That would cause a decrease in the chondrocyte differentiation, a decrease in hydroxyapatite formation, osteomalacia, and rickets. So this is um, a clearly uh, the mechanism behind a phosphatemic, hypophosphatemic rickets. So now I will go to an important um, clinical aspect of uh, detecting renal rickets. And our main challenge would be to differentiate renal rickets from nutrition rickets. I know it sounds weird because um, nutrition rickets uh, should be uh, seen in a child uh, who is growing well because nutrition rickets should happen only in a growing bone. Um, so you must be wondering why, why should there be a challenge at all? Why should it be difficult? But in reality, it's not so. Nutrition rickets can, um, can be can present at a later date it can be misdiagnosed and therefore at some point one does find it a challenge to differentiate nutrition from uh, renal rickets and uh, for just for the ease of uh, you know remembering these points of differentiating these two entities i put these points under 10 red flags the first flag is age so if you have rickets within 12 months of age think of vitamin D dependent rickets and renal tubular acidosis. We know that in nutrition rickets, we usually have rickets presenting between six months to two years. So if it is renal rickets, you have these two entities which come up less than one year of age. After one year, you have hypophosphatemic rickets, renal tubular acidosis, and of course, CKD. One interesting point here is, though hypophosphatemic rickets, the, the uh, the defective gene is there right since birth. You may be wondering why doesn't hypophosphatemic rickets present in the first year of life? They should be phosphate leak because there is a genetic defect that is there since birth. The answer is this. In the first year of life, the GFR is not normal, right? Physiologically, the GFR is not normal. A newborn's GFR is as low as 20 to 30. And this matures with time. And by the time the child is one and a half to two years of age, it is only then that the GFR comes to near adult values of 100, 120. So because the GFR is physiologically on the lower side, there is not so much phosphate leak in the first year of life. And therefore, kids don't manifest in the first year of life. As the GFR matures and becomes more towards normal, that's when the leak manifests and hypophosphatemic rickets actually is seen uh, clinically. Flag two, growth retardation. And you see these two girls here, both are of the same age. One was so short, the other one was a normal girl admitted for some other reason in the pediatric ward. And the girl on the right side has got chronic kidney disease. She's short, but both are 11 years of age. So you see, short stature is, some, is a very important red flag that should, um, that should uh, make us think of ruling out an underlying kidney problem. Flag three, family history. It's important to know if anybody in the family, siblings or parents had a history of similar complaints of bony deformities. You see family history usually positive in hypophosphatemic rickets, vitamin D dependent rickets and renal tubular acidosis. So this is a picture of a mother who had bow legs, but she was not symptomatic. And if one would not um, uh, 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 look for this, uh, then we would be missing a finding. And in India, because most of our mothers wear saris, the, the, the limbs are usually covered. So unless you make an effort to examine, we might miss this finding. Flag four, bony deformities. Yes, you've seen the bony deformity like, like bow legs that you just saw in the mother. In children also, you can get various kinds of deformity, which I'll be uh, showing you pictures uh, soon. But the bony deformities that I have here are characteristically known as widened wrists, 
you can see on the right side. And this picture on the left is a double malleoli. We have just, uh, you know, uh, tried to show the groove between the malleoli, and that is what one would palpate for as double malleoli. You can also have deformities like this girl, knock knees, which could cause bone pains, frequent falls, and motor delay. And here, I think it's it's good to just cover this aspect of um, having. Uh, a list of renal rickets that have a genetic basis. So you see on the right hand side, there are the gene mutations that are involved in various types of renal rickets, RTA, distal RTA, Fanconi syndrome, cystinosis, Fanconi Bickel syndrome. There's, a, there's an entity called dense disease, which is again a proximal tubular disorder. Again, uh, that, that also presents with metabolic you know, acidosis, phosphate wasting, hypercalciuria, nephrocalcinosis, occasionally rickets, and also with um, chronic kidney disease or an abnormal GFR. And then you have the vitamin D dependent rickets also having gene mutations mentioned here, and then hypophosphatemic rickets, there are different types, X-linked, autosomal dominant, recessive, and the fourth type called hypercalciuric hypophosphatemic rickets. And all these also have these uh, genetic mutations uh, here on the right hand side. The fifth flag is polyuria polydipsia. Notorious to have polyuria polydipsia as a presentation in renal tubular acidosis. These kids have sometimes, uh, the, though renal tubular acidosis doesn't present commonly with antenatal polyhydramnios, antenatal polyhydram is usually classically seen with Barter's syndrome and Barter's syndrome can very rarely have rickets, but the renal tubular acidosis usually presents with short stature, failure to thrive, repeated dehydration episodes, salt craving, um, constipation, which is a very important um, a sign of an underlying polyuric state. And uh, if the child doesn't drink enough water, then they present with constipation. So these, and of course, rickets. So these are, this is usually seen in renal tubular acidosis. The sixth flag is dentition. And as I mentioned earlier, hypophosphatemic rickets is notorious to present with various dentin and enamel defects and dental abscesses. And once these permanent um, uh, teeth, um, uh, once the milk teeth fall off, it takes a long time for the permanent teeth to uh, erupt. Some of them just don't have the permanent teeth coming up. So they have a lot of uh, dental issues. Then you have the seventh flag, which is muscle uh, weakness seen in vitamin D dependent rickets, renal osteodystrophy and renal tubular acidosis. And you see this kid. Can you believe that he's 14 years old? Yes, he is. He went from doctor to doctor with the problem of a posterior urethral valve. And this was what his, he ended up with at 14 years. Fulgration was done, but the story we know doesn't end there and he didn't get proper care. And he went into CKD, into end-stage renal disease. He was bedridden, he just couldn't get up. He was uh, so debilitated, emaciated. Look at his bones, look at his chest. He just succumbed after a few days of coming to our hospital, but he was 14 years old. So um, this is really an extreme a clinical scenario of uh, renal osteodystrophy associated with muscle weakness uh, and severe deformities. Flag eight, tetany or seizures. Now, this is a very characteristic sign of hypocalcemia. And one could also have, in addition to this, uh, seizures secondary to hypocalcemia. So this is again seen in vitamin D dependent rickets, renal tubular acidosis and renal osteodystrophy, the hypocalcemia as a presentation along with rickets. Flag nine is metabolic problems, by which I mean in renal tubular acidosis, you get metabolic acidosis. In hypophosphatemic rickets, obviously you have low phosphate, hyperphosphatemia. Now the only type of rickets, renal rickets, that is associated with a hyperphosphatemia is chronic kidney disease. Nowhere else you will have hyperphosphatemia associated with rickets. Hypocalcemia, seen in renal osteodystrophy, vitamin D dependent rickets. 
And the last flag is vitamin D resistance. We started off with this and we are trying to end the, um, the differentiating features with vitamin D resistance. And you see, after giving vitamin D, there is no healing. Rather, when you do an X-ray, you find these kind of lucent, large lucent cystic areas, osteitis fibrosa cystica, when there is uh, hyperparathyroidism and you can have fractures like this one. So clearly these are not features of uh, nutritional rickets. We are so used to seeing this X-ray, isn't it? The nutrition rickets, classically has this kind of appearance, the fraying, splaying, widening of the epiphyseal growth plate. And then after supplementation with vitamin D, you have the line, healing line coming up there. And there is evidence to say that there is good response to vitamin D. Now, nothing like this happens when there is vitamin D resistance or renal rickets. So how do we evaluate uh, renal rickets? And just to give a comparison of what we do with nutritional rickets, yes, we do serum calcium, phosphate, alkaline phosphorase, and sometimes we do a chest, um, wrist x-ray, I'm sorry, wrist x-ray to look at what we just saw in the previous slide, features of active uh, rickets or healing rickets. So in renal rickets, we do a lot of more um, tests, like uh, besides the first three markers, we do sometimes um, the urine analysis, but if you're looking at a proximal tubular acidosis, uh, which uh, wherein you look for amino acid urea, glycosuria, and serum bicarbonate is going to be a very important uh, investigation. Creatinine, as we already mentioned, needs needs to be done. And in certain cases, you would like to do a 25 hydroxy vitamin D or a 125 hydroxy vitamin D in dependent vitamin D dependent rickets. You will do a parathormone level. And of course, a long bone x-ray to look at uh, the uh, typical uh, defects that are seen with hyperparathyroidism secondary to chronic kidney disease. So I'll just run through some of the uh, case scenarios that will give you a better impression as to how these children present. So we have a 15-year-old boy who had recurrent UTI at six months of age and was diagnosed to have neurogenic bladder. He went into CKD stage four at eight years of age and he basically was unable to walk due to his lower limb deformity progressing over time. It just was lost to follow up. Uh, I think you're also quite familiar with the scenario that you know children with CKD just uh, disappear and then they come back some one fine day into the emergency with signs of uremia and that's what happened to this kid. He needed urgent hemodialysis, creatinine was 15, the serum calcium was 6, which is slow. I, I, I hope these units are um, something that you can relate to, milligram per deciliter, so calcium is low. Serum phosphate is um, high, 8 mg per deciliter. Uh, there was vitamin D deficiency, severe deficiency, and parathormone was really high. So definitely, this is a very typical scenario of chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, and having uh, rickets. So you see, this is the chest x-ray, and this boy just came last week. So I have all these pictures, um, uh, you know, uh, fresh uh, from from the evaluation of this child. So you see the uh, right right side, you see the hemodialysis catheter inserted into the right IJV. But more importantly, I would like you all to focus on the uh, ribs. Just look at those ribs. They are so, so osteopenic. They're so irregular. They look like they've all got eaten away. So this was his chest x-ray. This was how he looked like he had such gross deformities of his limbs. And when we took an X-ray, you can see the, in, in, in the contrast in, in, uh, compared to the nutritional rickets, you have uh, these uh, large areas of osteopenia and cystic-like lesions like uh, the one you see on the left and gross osteopenia in the X-ray on the right-hand side. So this was um, a child who came with chronic kidney disease, with uh, rickets. The complaint was he was not able to walk. Um, he was not able to sit up. He had muscle weakness too, but he came in because of a very different uh, complication of uremia and had to go on to emergency um, uh, dialysis. 
and the treatment here i would i would uh, summarize that in the end but i just wanted to start off with chronic kidney disease as a cause for renal rickets now we'll shift gears and go to this kid who's 14 years old he had short stature severe lower limb deformities but no polyuria no polydipsia so when you don't have polyuria and don't have polydipsia we are not dealing with renal tubular acidosis so we are dealing with some other tubular defect the serum phosphate is 1.6 which is very low serum calcium was normal pth was okay serum creatinine was okay so this is how the boy looked so this kid was short he had gross lower limb deformities more than upper limb deformities and uh, he had also dental uh, dentition uh, defects now we actually uh, this boy didn't come to us and this is what i think dr bima was referring to that these kids obviously parents look at him and what would you think as a parent you would think that there is some problem with his bone and who is the bone doctor it is the orthopedician right so this boy lands up with the orthopedician and they just want the bones to get corrected right they want the orthopedician to help their child look normal walk normally so it is at that point that the orthopedician looks at him and then tries to evaluate and sees that these are the uh, tests the phosphate is low the uh, the the um, child has got such gross deformities but does not have acidosis the creatinine is normal and then refers the child to the pediatric nephrologist and that's how we most often see these kids because they all land up either with the endocrinologist or with the orthopedician and then what we do we need to prove that he is leaking this phosphate in urine so we do a fractional excretion of phosphate and you all know there's a formula for that and once you do that if you you get you calculate the tubular reabsorption for phosphate which is 100 minus the fraction excretion of phosphate into 100 and let's remember that 85% of phosphate is reabsorbed it is only 10 to 15% of phosphate that you leak in urine this is normal but in hypophosphatemic rickets obviously this is not going to be the case and once you you calculate the trp which is not going to be the the reabsorption is not going to be 85% here but you will have to go ahead with another step of calculating the tubular maximum for phosphate which is indexed for gfr now how you do this is by using this walton bijovit nomogram so you see it looks complicated but it's really not if you look at this slope here this is the trp so say i have my trp uh say am i my the the trp is somewhere between um 0.8 that is 80% right and the phosphate is 2 serum phosphate then i take a scale and i slide the scale the scale should touch 2 the scale should touch 0.8 and the digit that comes on the right hand side this is the tmp and usually the tmp goes alongside the value of serum phosphate so that's a easy way to uh, look at it so this is the nomogram where you actually calculate trp and tmp the fractional excretion of phosphate of course you have to calculate that's the first step and then you look at this nomogram and derive the tmp so this will confirm that yes this child is leaking out phosphate the reabsorption is not normal and therefore this child has got hypophosphatemic rickets now in contrast to the x rays you just seen you see there is a difference here in hypophosphatemic rickets you do not get bone resorption you don't see that kind of resorption that you see with the other uh, types of renal rickets this is um, a picture of another child who was just 2 years of age but you can see that the child has got gross deformities but has also got hepatosplenomegaly and um, abdominal distension this child was uh, worked up by a, by the pediatric team and later referred to us because there was proximal tubular acidosis and there was also another problem the child was being suspected to uh, have um, have a liver problem 
underwent a liver biopsy. They were suspecting tyrosinemia. And yes, this child presented with rickets, had a proximal tubular acidosis, had hepatosplenomegaly. They did a liver biopsy. They did serum levels of tyrosine. Uh, 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 and then the urine showed succinyl acetone uh, levels to be high. So the diagnosis of tyrosinemia was made. And this was one of um, a rare presentation of uh, rickets due to a metabolic problem. And this was uh, published as a case report in the Kidney International nearly a decade ago. So this picture I put here because it, it is so grossly abnormal. You can see that, yes, this is a picture of the pelvis, but can you see something going across the pelvis? That's the catheter. This is the catheter, the peritoneal dialysis catheter that you see here. But what you also will definitely recognize is that there is the fracture of the neck of the femur uh, on the right side. And this is classically uh, the case in children who are affected by hyperoxylosis or uh, oxylosis or hyperoxyluria. Now, these kids, obviously, they, they, um, the type 1 uh, oxylosis kids, they end up in end-stage renal disease and many of them cannot afford to or do not have access to a liver kidney transplant and they remain on dialysis and this is one such kid who's remained on dialysis for seven years and still going. Um, going strong on, hemo uh, on peritoneal dialysis but you see the a number of uh, bone uh, related problems the child has, the bent bone, she's not able to walk well, she's had fractures without an injury. These are all trivial, um, a trivial um, impact or no impact, no fall, but just spontaneous fractures. So this is um, a, a really um, severe form of bone, um, bone related complication of a child with oxalosis on peritone dialysis. This is a two-year-old uh, kid who had episodes of seizures since infancy, severe failure to thrive, recurrent respiratory infections, and gross bony deformities, as you see here. Calcium was low, phosphate was normal, PTH was high, 25-hydroxy was 36, which is okay, and 125 was very low. So this child um, had vitamin D, dependent rickets type 1. This girl is a 12-year-old girl presented with failure to thrive, polyuria, polydipsia, uh, many episodes of dehydration. She came, she first presented at one, one, one and a half years of age and she's to become dehydrated very soon. She's to get hospitalized for these dehydration episodes and then she started having these bony deformities that progressed over time. So we diagnosed that she had proximal tubular acidosis. We did not have the, uh, uh, the um, opportunity to diagnose cystinosis in her earlier. We had to wait for cystine crystals to appear in her eyes which came up only after three or four years of age. And that, that's when we diagnose cystinosis in, in, in her. So we know that cystinosis is one of the important causes for end-stage renal disease among all the types of renal rickets. That's the only one that um, you know, ends up with end-stage renal disease. And of course, dense disease is the other one which can lead to end-stage renal disease. So her serum phosphate was fine. Calcium was on the lower side. PTH was high. Creatinine to begin with was 0.4, but over time it was abnormal. Finally, she ended up with end-stage renal disease at eight years of age. Bicarbonate was low. Electrolytes, you see the potassium is on the lower side, which is characteristic of renal tubular acidosis. The urine calcium creatinine ratio was high, which is again part of renal tubular acidosis. And you see this is the cysteine crystals uh, that you see in the slit lamp examination, the cornea and nephrocalcinosis. Both her kidneys had uh, nephrocalcinosis and all this is part and parcel of cystinosis. But the good part of the story is though she went into end-stage renal disease, her grandmother came forward to donate her kidney and uh, parents said that we would like to keep our kidneys as uh, uh, an option if 
grandmother's kidney fails at some point. So that was the decision by the family. And uh, this girl got transplanted at nine years of age. Uh, she was fine. Uh, she, she, she was preemptively transplanted. She didn't undergo any dialysis before that. And that's the best way to treat children, to uh, let them uh, get transplanted preemptively. And after about six months to eight months of um, her transplant, she, was, she came to us and she was actually in tears. So uh, we asked her, what is the problem? You have now got a normal kidney, you're doing well, you're going back to school. She said, no, my, my legs are still bent and my uh, classmates uh, laugh at me, they make fun of me. So I want my legs to be straightened. And that's exactly uh, what happens. Um, though the child presented quite uh, early, we treated the child uh, right from her uh, uh, younger days, that is at one, one and a half years. She progressed to ESKD, but then the deformities did persist. And all deformities do not um, revert to normal just with medication. So there are uh, selected uh, criteria to refer the child to an orthopedician for corrective surgery and we did just that and after her corrective surgery you see her legs are straight and there was a smile on her face so this is the success story of a child with renal rickets that look quite simple like renal tubular acidosis but then the diagnosis changed to cystinosis where we all knew now that she's going to end up into uh, end up with an end stage renal disease and that's exactly what happened but then she came out of it following transplant she also got her legs corrected and she's a happy girl now. She's 15 years of age uh, this year. So to uh, summarize the evaluation, the serum phosphate could be the starting point. If it is low or normal, then you look at the metabolic acidosis. If it is present, then you think of renal tubular acidosis or dense disease. If there is no metabolic acidosis, then you look at serum calcium and PTH. And if the serum calcium and PTH both are normal, then you look for phosphate leak by doing the fraction excretion of phosphate and calculating the TMP by GFR. And you would diagnose hypophosphatemic rickets. If there is increased PTH and low calcium, then you're thinking of vitamin D dependent rickets. Now to begin with, if the serum phosphate was high, we already mentioned that you don't have any confusion. It is associated with abnormal creatinine and that's seen in chronic kidney disease, mineral bone disease. So this is a table that summarizes the various um, parameters that we usually look for whenever we deal with a child with rickets. So in RTA, the calcium can be low, phosphate can be low normal, PTH will be high, the alkaline phosphatase will be high, urine calcium creatinine ratio, urine calcium will be high, 25 OHD, 125, there shouldn't be any problem, and FG23 is not really helpful. But in CKD MBD, you can have calcium low, phosphate is high, let's remember that phosphate is always high, uh, PTH is high, alkaline phosphatase can be high, the 25 hydroxy can be low if there's deficiency, and you really, really don't need to do a 125, but F23 is high. And in vitamin D dependent type one and type two again, you have calcium can be low, phosphate can be low normal, PTH can be high, alkaline phosphorus can be high. The difference comes only in 125 because we know that in, when there is a problem with the one alpha hydroxylase, then there is low 125. And in type two, the problem is not with the hydroxylase, the problem is with the receptor. And so 125 could be actually increased, though it's increased, the functionality is not seen. And in hypophosphatemic rickets, we have four types. Uh, so in general, the first three types, you will have normal calcium, low phosphate. The PTH can be normal. Alkaline phosphates can be normal or slightly raised. And you will have uh, a, a decrease in 125 OHD and you will have an increase in FGF23. It's only the last type, which is a hypercalciuric 
hypophosphatemic rickets. The term itself tells us that there is hypercalciuria, so the urine calcium will be um, high and the 125 will be opposite, will be high uh, and not low like in the other forms of hypophosphatemic rickets. So this is from an investigation point of view, the various parameters that you will ask for and how you could differentiate uh, between the four different types of oh, renal rickets. So coming to the uh, last part is the management. I would just run through uh, the management of each of these entities uh, briefly. So in renal tubular acidosis, what happens here is many of our children get vitamin D, loads and loads of vitamin D when they present with rickets. And especially when it is renal tubular acidosis, then these kids manifest with hypercalciuria, nephrocalcinosis, not necessarily due to renal tubular acidosis, but aggravated by the excess vitamin D uh, supplementation. So let's be very careful of giving vitamin D in a child who's not responded. There's no need to continue to give loads and loads of vitamin D and cause other problems. The way to treat rickets in renal tubular acidosis is to supplement sodium bicarbonate, and give oral potassium syrups either through chloride or potassium citrate, phosphate supplements when there is a proximal tubular acidosis and active vitamin D again in proximal tubular acidosis. And in renal tubular acidosis, it is usually a lifelong supplementation with these medications. And there can be a very good improvement in the limb deformities if treatment has begun early, especially in distal tubular acidosis. In hypophosphatemic rickets, now this is interesting because there is some new drug that, that has got discovered for hypophosphatemic rickets. So obviously you give phosphate supplementation, that is the mainstay. You also administer active vitamin D and that is to prevent uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism. And this is the wonder drug, burosumab. Burosumab is a monoclonal antibody against FGF23. Remember we mentioned that FGF23 is increased. So there, this drug goes and inhibits FGF23 and helps uh, in, in the uh, correction of the defects in, in the symptomatic, um, uh, 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 symptoma it, it, it improves the symptoms of a child with hypophosphatemic rickets, whether it's bone pain or uh, deformities. So this is usually given as a subcutaneous dose every two weeks, this drug. Of course, I have no experience. Uh, we have not got it uh, in our center yet, but this is uh, the drug that has come out as a new therapeutic agent for hypophosphatemic rickets. And of course, all that we do, still there could be some residual deformity. And once we stabilize the biomarkers like phosphate, alkaline phosphorus and PTH, it is time to uh, get back to our orthopedic colleagues and request them for surgical correction. Of course, there are guidelines and recommendations as to when these corrections have to be done. What are the prerequisites for these corrections? Renal osteodystrophy, you have um, a, a, a combination of supplements, native vitamin D if there's deficiency, active vitamin D, calcium, phosphate restriction, either through diet, through binders and of course bicarb supplements for the metabolic acidosis and for vitamin d dependent rickets type 1 we give one alpha hydroxy vitamin d which is an active form but which does not require hydroxylation remember we said that that was the defect there the one alpha hydroxylase was the problem so you can give one al one alpha hydroxy vitamin d that you that skips the hydroxylation process so that can be administered along with calcium and in vitamin D dependent type two, we have to go, we know that here it's a receptor problem. So you have to give really mega doses of vitamin, active vitamin D. And even then you may not have good clinical outcomes. So this is the consensus statement that came in Nature Reviews on clinical practice recommendations for the diagnosis and management of X-linked hypophosphatemia. And uh, here uh, you, you will find if anybody is interested to look at more details of what this drug is, how, what are the trials uh, that has led to the recommendation of this drug, Burosumab, what are the indications for surgical correction, how do we look after the other problems. There is craniosynostosis, there are dental lift defects, there's limb deformities, there's so many um, comorbidities associated with hypophosphatemic rickets.
So to conclude, renal rickets is usually in the form of vitamin D resistant and dependent rickets. Manifestations of renal rickets definitely differ from nutrition rickets and one has to differentiate these two. So remember my 10 red flags for that. Renal rickets is treatable. You can treat it, you can bring it under control, but it's not by just supplementing vitamin D. It's beyond vitamin D. It's all about which type of renal rickets you're talking about and then supplementing the bicarbonate, the phosphate, potassium, and so on. Cystinosis, very important cause of renal rickets that will end up with end-stage renal disease. Burosumab is the new therapeutic agent for hypophosphatemic rickets. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Alpana, thank you so much for that very inspiring and eloquent uh, lecture. I really think, you know, this is a very difficult subject and I'm glad you did it and not me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because it's really something that is hard to encapsulate in within an hour, you understand? <laughs> and you've really done an excellent job, I must say. Sorry, I don't put it, I'm not putting my video on because I'm trying to not get the buffering. <laughs> but uh, I, I think, you know, you've really done a great job in, 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 in putting everything together. And I think for the fellows and everyone else who's on this uh, meeting that, uh, you know, your approach is excellent. And that's exactly how I approach it, actually. You know, if you get a case of uh, records and it's not responding to vitamin D, you look at the phosphate level, then you look at your, your other parameters, your PTH, and you go each one and, and look at the metabolic acidosis, look at the, what, what your uh, 125 and 25 hydroxy vitamin D are, and, each, and as you go through it systematically as you've done, you know, it's not difficult to arrive at that. Yeah? So thank you so much for that. Um, before I um, open the floor for questions, I just want to make a few comments, if you don't mind, Arthur. Um, you know, uh, the one thing about rickets is that we must always understand it's actually a misnomer because it's a radiological diagnosis. It's not a clinical diagnosis. It's not a biochemical diagnosis. So what, it's a radiological diagnosis which, which says that there's failure of calcification at the epiphyseal growth plate. And that's the hallmark of it due to an aberration of vitamin D, phosphate, calcium, or something like that. Okay, But it's merely a radiological diagnosis. And you are absolutely right in saying the hypophosphatemic X-linked dominant type of records, which presents um, what we see in our population. I very seen it before the age of five years. I must say I, I I can't recall a single patient that I've seen, you know, before. And that's because, as you said, you know, one is thing is the GFR is still progressing. The other thing is FGF twenty three is high in the in the early period, and so what happens is it actually compensates for that. Uh, it, it's not that high. So it compensates for it. So the high phosphate, milk content, etc. And um, the third thing was that the deformities that occur with records in one that you showed, which were very nicely uh, on the x-rays and the, the clinical things, usually the ones occur after weight bearing. You know what I mean? It's, you don't yes. find it in young yes. children. Yeah? Yes. So like a thickened wrist, thickened ankles and all that, it's only after weight bearing. So, uh, you know, you are right that if you get a young child, less than a year, presenting with rickets, with either, you know, cranio, um, what do you call it, craniotabies or uh, convulsions and uh, uh, osteopenic bones, it's not going to be just uh, nutritional rickets. You understand what I mean? Because they don't present with the clinic, classical science there. Uh, the, the one other factor that I noticed that in the hypophosphatemic rickets, as opposed to the hypocalcemic rickets, you don't get so much hypotonia, you know? Uh, and the hypotonia is, I had one child referred from me from the neurology clinic. And I said, why are you calling her, me to see this child who's got hypotonia? They said, no, you know, we noticed that the phosphate level is low and the calcium is low, etc. This child actually turned out to have rickle because it's a classical form of hypotonia without weakness. You know what I mean? In yes. that age group. And uh, I don't know if you had that experience, but that was one child that I saw, which was sent to <laughs> because he had this right, right. and hypotonia the, the, and this uh, abdominal dysfunction. Like. Hypophosphatemic rickets, the, yeah. the phosphopenic rickets in general, yeah. they yeah. don't have muscle weakness as much as yes. the calcipenic rickets. So we, we, do, yeah. we, we, we have the same experience. Yes. Yeah. And the one point that uh, I know that um, our orthopedic surgeons and I always have a fight over is 
when do you do such yeah, we here in nephrology have fights many the neonatologists the orthopedic the orthopedic surgeons are okay they are surgeons so they want to operate okay and yeah. i will counsel the parents and say listen let's wait and what i do is i wait until the child has actually reached close to puberty when the epiphysis is closed because bone remodeling is taking place right so if you collect correct the acidosis and other electrolyte abnormalities and all that you got a good chance of 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 having this what happens is in my experience is when you operate too early the deformities just tend to recur and then the child needs a second op you understand yeah. i mean so unless yeah. it is debilitating unless the child is knocking had knocked knees and falling over or yeah. if it's a female child and she is becoming very conscious at that age it's something that you know there must be some other strong indication for us yeah. to do surgery earlier than on puberty so yeah. i always wait till we do uh, as a uh, reach puberty and then do it and the other thing i wanted to bring up is that actually the that rickets due to proximal renal tubular acidosis you can do it without very much investigations because all you look at is a dipstick on the urine and you find glycosuria okay True. and very simple test that i teach the the fellows that you know you can diagnose it at the bedside you know what i mean because in the presence of a normal blood sugar if you're getting glycosuria i mean you have to unless that is familial glycosuria which is exceedingly rare and the child's got signs of rickets this is proximal yeah. renal yeah. acidosis you know so that's uh, and the last thing was just to tell you that with cystinosis we don't have it but i don't know if in india you have systemia exactly so we don't have it and uh, this was this was why um i was trying to say that uh, soda bicarbonate was not available mm. there but then we feel the same here because we just don't have systemic and uh, this is really uh, been a struggle for decades i should say uh, yes. there are some pockets uh, in the country that uh, that that uh, you know try to procure and distribute that but it's not something that is easily available and even if it's as e- available uh it is quite expensive so yeah. we have not been successful in having any of our families um you know uh, reach out to using cystamine and therefore we know that uh, we can only treat the proximal tubular acidosis we can wait for end stage renal disease but the um but the unfortunate thing is that we can't uh, offer them cystamine okay so the thing is i have a family that had with with cystinosis and the only way i got it was i got a friend in chicago and he sent it across to me <laughs> okay the thing is it's very difficult to get it in in south africa yes. but uh, fortunately you know um, this family man, i feel bad for the others who cannot afford it and therefore they just yeah. don't get it but it tends to work well it doesn't completely resolve the situation but you can buy time you know with that especially with the eye complications anyway thank you very much for that i'm going to open the floor now uh, to uh, to everyone else i don't want to hog this meeting so <clears throat> does anyone have any questions i'm looking at the chat i don't yes um yes, yes um yes go ahead go ahead uh, 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 rima thank you very much and yeah. thank you our panel uh, this is excellent presentation yeah and really very good presentation um, i really appreciate it and uh, so my question is um when you are evaluating the bone uh, involvement uh, you have seen you have been using x-ray to see the bone involvement but i know when x-ray by the time you get defect on x-ray you know the disease has already advanced so fast yes. now uh, so if you want to uh, you know diagnose bone involvement in the l stage can you uh, actually do the bone density measurements and bone biopsy yeah, you know, like uh, bone density using dexa method or using bone biopsy as usual can can can, can, can that be done in 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 pediatrics and how often have you been doing this in in india for example okay so talking of renal rickets Uh, the four different uh, types of renal rickets so let me let me just go through each one of them in renal tubular acidosis we we don't need to look at uh, the demineralization of bone uh, through a dexa scan uh, it it's uh, you it, it's enough to do an x ray and look at findings uh, because you know that there is going to be um, you know uh, the bones are going to get affected and you once you start treating the rta then you would also be treating the underlying bone defect 
similarly, in hypophosphatemic rickets, uh, there is no need to again look at any scans for DMA. You can do it. it the, those scans would just tell you that there is defective mineralization. Uh, but the uh, important part is only when you're talking about CKD. So in CKD and bone mineral disease, yes, there is a role for um, DEXA scan to look at demineralization. And in, uh, in children, of course, we have never done it, but then in, in, in adults, definitely a bone biopsy would be the gold standard to look at the bone turnover, the volume. So if you want to really evaluate for bone, bone mineral disease in CKD, then bone biopsy is an ideal uh, tool. But we don't do it in our center. We don't do it in uh, children. So I would say that uh, DEXA and bone biopsy is limited to only uh, children with CKD and renal rickets and not the other forms of renal rickets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, Apana, do you mind if I just make one comment about that? Right? Yes, please. That is that, uh, Dr. Karibi, Karibi, that, you know, both of these things, one is bone, DEXA is quite, quite costly, okay? Yes. Uh, yes. It's quite an expensive undertaking. And it hasn't been shown in children to be that useful because normal standards in a very young child yes, also are not are, yes, yes. And there's no normal grams for it. Yes. Bone biopsy is quite an invasive procedure. Yes. Okay, it's quite yes. painful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't want to subject in yeah. children to that, right? As opposed to adults. Not that adults don't feel pain, but yeah, particularly yeah. children, we don't want to subject them to that. And the role I have only think that so far from the literature, and Atmana, you can just correct me, is. Only when you have a dynamic bone disease and you can't really deal with it, that bone, uh, uh, both of these tests come into play, right? Because in the other forms, I mean, what you are going to do is you're going to be Any able to correct your abnormalities and yes. then the records will correct automatically. You understand? I mean, so you don't want to do Even with the dynamic bone disease, I think we can yeah. still manage. We yeah. have other parameters, surrogate yeah. parameters that will yeah. give us an idea that there's an adynamic bone disease. So we yeah. really don't need to be invasive, uh, uh, you yeah. know, in terms of so bone. We, we try and in, in the pediatric uh, setting not to do these tests, okay, yeah. as far as possible. Correct. Dr. Gilbert has a question. It's in okay. the question okay. box. Okay. From uh, yeah. uh, the, the question here is, um, I have a patient with cystinosis on cystagon ordered from France. Now losing his sight, but he's allergic to cyst drops. Uh, and his question is: Anyone has any experience with the same case? So, Dr. Dr. Gilbert is a leading pediatric nephrologist at Royal, trained at South Africa. So, welcome, Dr. Gilbert. Thank you for that question, Dr. Gilbert. Uh, we had uh, we have cystiamine eye drops. Uh, we don't have cystagon otherwise, but we have the eye drops. And we have used that in two kids, um, but we have not experienced the problem of allergy that you are mentioning. So um, I would not be able to share my experience on that. Okay. Um, well, there's a comment here from um, Dr. Nikhil Lawrence. He says in the Western Cape, they do have cystamine. I think uh, it's a uh, contemporaneous preparation mainly. In, uh, but as I know from one of the plane, we tried to get it, but our pharmacy unfortunately could not prepare it for us for whatever reason. I've written section 21 applications, etc., but we never got it <laughs> for whatever reason. They just don't want to okay it. But no, thanks for that comment. Okay, um, anyone else got a comment? I don't see anything else on the chat. Doctor uh, Francis, um, Francis. Yeah. Um, yes, can hello. You? Yeah, hello? Francis. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. What's your experience in, in Tanzania, Francis? Uh, all right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pana, and thank you, Dr. Bima, for yeah. the comment. I think it is, uh, well, um, so working from this end of the world, it's a little bit difficult and challenging when you're um, faced with these children. So I would like to say, first of all, we don't have soda big available here. We recently started getting uh, sodium bicarbonate tablets, which are basically for adults. So it is. it was a little bit difficult. Whenever we had kids that needed sodium bicarbonate, we had to resort to giving them baking soda. Yeah. So that's, 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 what, that's, what, what, we, yeah, that's what we've been trying to use. And uh, of course, the other, the other challenge is the fact that sometimes it is so difficult to be able to, to evaluate these patients because some of these investigations were not readily available 
but in the past in the past five years we've had a lot of private labs that have come in so at least they've made it uh, this test available but then they are also quite cost so sometimes it is difficult to be able to uh, invest, invest, investigate these patients and I guess the other the other um, the challenge is the fact that these kids might not come to pediatrician as pediatrician because they have yeah. deformities so they will start being seen by the orthopedic surgeons and sometimes they will come with corrective osteotomy which has been <laughs> which have been done several times which is pity and uh, very very unfortunate without evaluating the patients to see if there are any other uh, causes that might be resulting to that so i think it is uh, uh, a little bit difficult and challenging of course i've uh, uh, Bima, I've commented that some of these uh, medications are available at Red Cross. I was uh, fortunate enough to work at Red Cross for with uh, the team there, and we had a lot of these things. We had kids with uh, uh, cystinosis and all these things, and they were they were getting medication. So it was uh, quite in interesting and um, a good experience there. But things are not that uh, rosy down here. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much uh, for that comment. And uh, I must say, um, yeah, system in uh, you're getting it. I know, yeah, and it's available in the Western Cape. We had a patient that uh, came to us, and unfortunately, we couldn't get it. And as I said, you know, I don't know whether there's no supplier for it because we asked around. I don't know whether it's a contemporaneous, but that means it's made in house by your pharmacist or whether you're like getting where Western Cape is getting it from. Some, but I we tried very hard to get it, and we just failed. Um, just one point about this um, bicarbonate correction that we need to bring up, and I don't know if others have seen it, but when you use Shoal solution, um, which is what we are using uh, back here, if we correct acidosis after a while, but, and you have to use in the, some of these patients, especially with the proximal form, because they are losing bicarbonate a lot, quite high doses. One of the side effects that we get is severe diarrhea. And it's often difficult to balance the amount that you need with the diary, because if you give too much, you get diarrhea, and of course, you lose more bicarbon that way. But if you give too little, then you don't correct it. And uh, sometimes it becomes quite a challenge in this patients. What's your experience with that, Arvind? So we have, uh, I have used uh, Shaw solution because now we don't use it. But yeah. uh, in the beginning of my career in nephrology, that is two decades back, we used to use Shaw solution. Shaw solution was prepared by our pharmacy. And so it contains sodium citrate and citric acid. And uh, the problem, yes, diarrhea is one uh, notorious problem. The other problem was that the shelf life was short. Sure. So we used to find that if the bottle, which was like a one liter bottle, people would take that. Uh, and if that remains after four weeks, then there would be fungus growing in that uh, solution. And they would just throw it away and come back to uh, get another bottle. So the shelf life was an issue and uh, of course diarrhea but then it worked very well so uh, it was prepared by the pharmacy of course we have never had a problem with sodium bicarbonate so as soon as the child is old enough to take tablets we would switch shawl solution to soda mint tablets yeah. uh, but yes i agree with you if that can be prepared then it's a good alternative to sodium bicarbonate yeah. maybe you should think about it uh, Dr. Pans. Sure, I'll do that. Is there, are there any other questions for uh, uh, Dr. Arpana, are they, uh, What are the I mean, uh, suggestions that you'd make in terms of overcoming, overcoming barriers to early diagnosis of these issues? You know, uh, quite often the children come later. You know, the X-ray, which would be very late, and you know, quite a few of the kids that you showed is pretty late. So yes. what do you think these barriers, how do you think it so at least to an extent? Yes. At so least I to an extent. To an extent, yeah. yes. So what we can do is to create awareness among the first contact doctors. So usually the pediatricians, the orthopedicians, the endocrinologists, um, adult endocrinologists, um, uh, who, who would actually see these uh, children uh, earlier than a pediatric nephrologist. So uh, to have tie-ups with an orthopedician or orthopedic team and a general pediatric team, because uh, they are the ones who will look at these deformities at the earliest, if at all. And to recognize that this is 
not nutritional and going towards something uh, that is non-nutritional is the first step. And I think there it would be good to have a um, you know, collective effort in approaching the child's problem. So I would say that is the key. Uh, rest, rest is quite simple. As once the, the diagnosis is made, uh, we, we, we don't have to struggle with the management. It is straightforward as long as we know uh, the diagnosis for the renal rickets. So I think you also would have the same kind of issue. And we are still struggling with this issue, though it sounds simple when I say it, but then uh, it takes a lot of effort to get everybody under the same page, on the same page. Thank you. What we did in our hospital, we went mm -hmm. to the orthopedic ward and we instructed them that no child goes to theater <laughs> until it is seen by a nephrologist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Almost did that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Now we've got an excellent team. I must say that uh, yes. our orthopedic surgeons, uh, before they operate now, we, we, we Sometimes I even get I even get called to 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 evaluate Blount's disease. No signs of records here, please. And this is Blount's disease. But anyway, they, yeah, yeah, exactly. they have they over over. Or metaphysical dysplasias. Okay. Yes, uh, yes. Coming in <laughs> as rickets. Yeah. Yes. Okay, um, but um, are there anyone? Is there anyone else that would like to ask that? Uh, any questions? One in the chat box. I think chat box is one more from Dr. Gilbert. Yes, we don't have oral sodabic. What are your comments on using IV sodabic orally? Well, that can be done. Yeah, we do, we that. do that. We do that often. We often use that. Yes. But, um, That's a good alternative. Not very palatable, but it's good. Yeah. <laughs> we mix it up <laughs> with some orange juice. Time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's great. Anyway, if there's no other questions, I think we're going on for time. Thank you so much. Uh, I have to thank you all. Uh, I had a grand time yeah, both last time kidding. and this week. Yeah. And uh, I really hope there'll be some day I can come and meet you all physically sure. in person. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lloyd, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Bhima, for a uh, lovely interaction today. Um, I hope to meet you all in person soon. Yes. No, thank you we, very much. We will definitely yeah. do that. But thank you yeah, so much for really your yeah, yeah, we should do that. It will thank happen, you. I'm sure. Thank you so okay, much. have a good evening. All the best.